My name is Nina Holland. I work with Corporate Europe Observatory. We're a lobby watchdog organization based in Brussels. Uh, so what we do on a day-to-day -day basis is we uh, do research and campaigning against the power that corporations have over decision making, both on the EU level and also on other levels, on issues such as climate, trade, uh, banking sector, but also agribusiness. So we also focus on uh, food, agriculture, biotech companies and pesticide companies. So, let me see how this works. Uh, I have made a little uh, lobbying guide, if you like, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, available uh, in print as well. And in that you will find this picture uh, with uh, uh, three groups, three large categories, you could say, of uh, lobbying strategies. So how do these corporations actually uh, get their way? And uh, to make it a little bit more, generate a little bit more insight into that, uh, we, I uh, listed a, a number of strategies under these three categories. Uh, so you have the direct lobbying, you have everything that is PR and propaganda, and underneath that you have targeting and undermining uh, the science that we have heard already a lot about from Claire Robinson uh, yesterday. So, for instance, direct lobbying, that is the classical lobbying that everyone knows about, the knocking on doors, organizing events, making sure that you have your address book ready, that you have your networks in place, uh, hiring lobby firms and law firms to do the work for you, uh, etc. But what we see in Brussels, in Washington and many other places, it goes much further than that. Uh, a lot of the lobbying is really about um, bending the rules before they are even made. So being there early, and that means a number of things. That means, for instance, that you use the revolving doors. So you basically institutionalize lobbying, which means you try to get the right people in the right place. If you have already very industry-minded or industry-friendly people in the decision-making power, then you already know that you're not going to be uh, getting much trouble. So here is the famous example of Michael Taylor, who went through the revolving doors, this is in the US, uh, four times uh, between Monsanto, or for a law firm working for Monsanto, and some of the US government uh, agencies like the USDA and the FDA. So he has been very instrumental in shaping the fact that GMOs are, lar are largely, in, in, in fact, not regulated uh, in the US. But in the EU, we see something very similar. It's a very complicated picture. Uh, so I advise you to look at it again uh, in a week or so uh, with a fresh mind. But have a look at the uh, bottom left, ILSI, the, uh, the International Life Sciences Institute. Uh, they are a worldwide organization with offices in, uh, across the world, also in Brussels. And they have for a long time been operating uh, rather uh, in the dark. Nobody knew really what they were. But they act as a kind of a shadow EFSA. And EFSA is the European Food Safety Authority. So what they do is they organize conferences and working groups, bringing together scientists from government, uh, academia and industry. And they try in that way to promote industry-friendly methodologies, industry-friendly uh, approaches to science, and they finance that. Monsanto has been found, especially in uh, ILSI in the US, to be one of the big financial backers of ILSI. They are also one of the uh, um, uh, financial donors to ILSI uh, in Europe. They are a member of, uh, of ILSI. Uh, of course, Monsanto is very organized. All these agribusiness corporations are very organized all together, uh, as if they were the best of friends. They are a member of many lobby associations. So in Europe, they will be a member of the chemical lobby, CEPI, uh, of the uh, American equivalent, the ACC, American Chemistry Council, uh, the, uh, on the European side, the European Seeds Association, on the US side, it's the American Seed Trade Association, uh, the same goes for uh, the European Crop Protection Association, which is the pesticide lobby group, and on the other hand, it's Crop Life America. So, you see that when you want to track Monsanto lobbying, in fact, it's not that easy. Monsanto operates very much uh, below the radar, much uh, more below the radar than the other Co corporations like Bayer and Basef and uh, Dow Dupont. Uh, in fact, they hardly use their own name at all in Brussels. 
They always operate via these associations or uh, let their lobbying be done by a platform with another name or by a lobby firm such as Hugh Brophy, Fleischmann Hillard, Edelman or Intel. So we have here um, uh, a recent uh, example. Uh, I have also included a chapter on lobbying in, in Africa. Uh, none of this is very exhaustive, but it's just to show a bit the, the, tactic, the tactics and the strategies that they use. In Africa, you know, what has been observed very often is that they have actually set up lobby groups funded by Monsanto directly or via the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that we will hear more about later tonight. And one of these examples is the um, African Biosafety uh, Expertise Network, uh, where this um, mister is, is from that you see on the picture. Because by now we have moved to the section PR and greenwashing, PR and propaganda. So one of the uh, activities that uh, the European Biotech Lobby that Monsanto is a member of, Europa Bio, will organize in Brussels, this was last week, is an event uh, that was meant to uh, unshackle innovation uh, with uh, GM Cross. So this is another attempt to say, you know, uh, let's uh, fully go for commercializing, for cultivating uh, GM crops in, uh, in Europe, and let's no longer stop and block uh, innovation and uh, progress. Uh, what's interesting about this event is that it was both to greenwash, but also the opposite, to verify the critics. This is very important. We've heard yesterday from Claire Robinson about the attacks on whistleblowers, the attacks on scientists. This is also happening attacks on NGOs. So any kind of critic uh, can uh, get a, a good bashing. Uh, and uh, in uh, the latest episode, we've heard already yesterday a little bit about it was the uh, open letter by 107 Nobel laureates uh, saying to, to Greenpeace that they should no longer oppose GMOs and in particular that they should no longer block the uh, uh, making golden rice available uh, to especially in poor countries which is the supposedly vitamin A uh, enriched rice that uh, Syngenta and the International Rice Research Institute have been working on now for 20 years. Only, uh, apparently, even you can fool so many Nobel laureates uh, that even this rice is not yet commercially available and that really had nothing to do with that. So it was a, a, an enormous stunt uh, that uh, fortunately was also uh, very quickly uh, rebutted uh, by uh, Greenpeace Philippines, so that was uh, very good. But Richard Roberts, the Nobel laureate that, um, that ran the campaign, uh, he uh, came to Brussels and he spoke in this event on uh, unshackling innovation. And of course, maybe you've heard also that at the press launch of this event, of this uh, uh, letter, this action by the Nobel laureate, uh, actually there was uh, one of the uh, PR guys of Monsanto was actually uh, present. Now a little bit more about the science. Uh, uh, going to the looking at this picture, there's another logo there, and that is PRRI, and that's another interesting group. It's also a bit of a Dutch anecdote. We'll get to that later, uh, because it was founded by a Dutch a former Dutch official who did work at the UN level on biosafety, but because he was so biased, he uh, had to leave, and he founded this group uh, that, that pretended to defend the interest of public scientists in GMO regulation. Uh, so it's really a bit of a, this list of members is a bit of a who is who in the scientific world that is on the pro-GM uh, side, and very often they have links with the industry. So this is the kind of events that they were organized, but they used to also be very active um, at the UN level. Third party voices are very important. Uh, the Nobel laureates is a, um, is a case in point. Uh, third party voices, that means it's not Monsanto saying it, it's not Europa Bio saying it, it's the Nobel laureates saying it, or it's the farmers saying it. So in Brussels we've even seen a fake farmers group being set up to promote uh, GM food. This was called the Biotech the Farmers Biotech Network, 
but it was a study from Europa Bio and a PR firm and that only represented 18 single individual farmers. So it had nothing to do with like a genuine uh, farmers organization. Uh, the messages. So messages in PR and propaganda are extremely important and we need to take this into account. Now with the TTIP negotiations we see a true revival of turning every concept and, and uh, idea and term upside down. So promoting innovation uh, instead of embashing precaution as if precaution is against innovation but also sound science. This is a very old term that was invented by the tobacco industry to basically say our science, industry science, is the sound science. And if you can't absolutely prove that our product is, um, uh, is not safe, then uh, your science is junk science. That was also what Marcelo Fibro yesterday said uh, here. That you're, as a scientist, easily accused of, of uh, uh, producing junk science. Very important also is the uh, influence on academic research. Uh, Wageningen University uh, is a very good example uh, that is involved in a public-private partnership with Monsanto and other companies called the Seed Valley. And not surprisingly, in a, a daily newspaper in the Netherlands, on the Monsanto Tribunal, it was the chair of the Wageningen University that was the only one that stood up for Monsanto and said that this um, whole event was just a, a, an event of um, complex thinkers. Finally, uh, a Dutch anecdote, uh, because uh, well, we're in the Netherlands and uh, a lot of this stuff uh, comes from here, unfortunately. <coughs> uh, 1996, the first round of ready soy comes into Europe. And who was behind the PR campaign? Schutterla and Partners, a Dutch PR firm. Uh, that made sure that Monsanto's uh, story, so the introduction of the Round Brain Soy, was accompanied by a very sophisticated media strategy, which started already a year early, and the motto was, let sleeping dogs lie. So to really massage and smooth, smoothen the message in with journalists, with decision makers, to make sure that by the time that it actually arrived, it was no longer news, uh, and that uh, people were convinced that this stuff was, uh, was safe. <coughs> Um, you will also see in their logo, science-based consultancy with sense, uh, very eloquent. Uh, science-based is the equivalent of sound science. Wherever you see it, you have reason to be a bit suspicious. Um, ten years later, the same PR firm is involved in the round table on responsible soy, which is also a Dutch invention, and basically gives a green label uh, for um, even Roundup Ready Soy, without any criteria against deforestation or pesticides that uh, are really based on, uh, on anything. And uh, unfortunately, the Dutch government sponsors it still, and Dutch NGOs like WWF Solidaridad even support it. So it's really uh, unbelievable, uh, but unfortunately it's one of these uh, greenwashing uh, schemes that are also a bit of a Dutch invention. Finally, they run the campaign to get the new uh, range, the new generation of GM techniques, the new GMOs completely excluded from regulation, deregulated, not tested, not labeled. So these are the so they set up the new breeding techniques platform. Uh, that's what they run. It's not about new breeding techniques. When you hear that, uh, you can think, okay, this is new GM techniques. In reality, it's the techniques in question are listed below. There are the techniques that the uh, European Commission is currently looking at and they have been trying to get all these techniques deregulated not with scientific arguments but with legal trickery. So hereby I end with this, uh, all these nice Dutch uh, PR lobby products and uh, I'll pass the word uh, to Hans. We have a bit of a political crisis going on right now in Belgium. And, uh, um, sorry it's late, but I will have to bother you with a little explanation about the very difficult, complicated state of Belgium. But it's relevant, I'll, I'll try to keep it short. Um, and it's, it's relevant because it shows very clearly why uh, these kind of trade agreements are in their, in their essence undemocratic. As you know, next Tuesday the European Ministers of uh, Trade uh, will come together 
in Brussels to put their signature under the CETA agreement, the EU-Canada agreement. Uh, later that next week, 20, 20 and 21 October, it's the head of, heads of state will do the same. To then have a joyful meeting the 27th of October in Brussels with John Trudeau and the uh, European uh, president and uh, whatever, heads of uh, whatever, to sign CETA. And then it will be a fact. Because they promised this summer to have it as a mixed agreement, which means that the national parliaments or the regional parliaments will have to ratify it and will have to vote on it. And we are quite sure if that probably will not pass all parliaments. But what the, what the EU Council didn't say this summer, because everybody was saying, ah, oof, at least they have some democratic sense, uh, because it will be a mixed agreement. Um, what, what they didn't say is that there will be a provisional application, which means that basically CETA, as soon as the signatures are on the document, will be applied. Um, and so this is the first indication of, you know, democracy and this kind of um, um, trade agreements are a bit on a, in a tense uh, a relation. Now, Belgium. Um, uh, Bart, the uh, MEP uh, I work for is from Flanders. Um, so basically we have, we are a sort of federal state. You have Brussels uh, Parliament, Brussels government. Walloon uh, uh, parliament and government, and a Flemish parliament and government, and then you also have a German, and uh, federal, and some others. Whatever. We have a lot of government, which is actually a good thing, um, which is proven by this uh, case. Um, the Brussels and Walloon government passed a resolution on CETA saying that because there was too much things unclear, because there was too much things that they found important, mainly social and environmental and services, public services issues, they couldn't agree with the current text. So they passed an agreement, uh, a resolution saying we urge our government not to sign this. Now if one of the federal partners in the construction called Belgium is not agreeing, it means that the Belgian government cannot sign. And this is what's going on right now. Um, last Friday, uh, yesterday, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was a bit of a crisis yesterday. Um, so last Friday, there were, there were debates again in the in the Walloon Parliament and the Brussels Parliament, and to our pleasant surprise, they repeated their statement and did not fall into the trap which was set up by the, so the German Social Democrats or the French. Uh, a socialist, so-called socialist government, saying, well, but we will have a sort of extra annex to the treaty, saying that later on we will solve the issues. But we recognize, we listen to you, and we will solve it later. Now, just to be very clear on that, it's complete juridical bullshit, because the, this uh, 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 explanatory uh, statement, I think it's called, has no juridical value, according to experts. I'm not an expert, but I listen to juridical experts, and they tell us, that this has no value. So basically, when the European government signs CETA in a week, in a few days actually, this means from that day on, ISDS or the transformed form of it called ICS is going to be applicable. That's the cold facts. And this, you know, um, so-called uh, explanatory note, again, has no has no meaning. And what, is, what, what makes us very angry is basically that, um, that some politicians in, in the European hemisphere are, I just would like to call it misleading, or maybe even just plain lying to people to sort of you know, cool down the atmosphere because there is a lot of uh, uh, protest going on in Europe. As you know, you're pro probably part of it, the ones who come from Europe. Actually, recently, um, Someone from a, from a European NGO who is, who is um, I think it's the Seattle to Seattle network, yeah, who, who said something very interesting. She said um, this anti-trade, uh, free trade uh, agreement uh, movement is is unique because it's uniting people from the south, the north, the west, the east. Um, if you know about the situation in Europe right now, it's it's getting pretty bad. You know, it's. A lot of divisions. I won't go into details on that. You probably follow the news on Greece, etc. Um, Europe is getting more and more, 
is more and more falling apart, basically, and, and it's a complex story. But so this movement is a very positive European story because it's uniting people over many different issues from consumers, organizations, unions, uh, farmers, etc., uh, etc. Et and so um, instead of um, instead of uh, um, you know seeing it as a positive thing, uh, our our national uh, media are are you know are now the Flemish ones. Yesterday it was really horrible. Uh, we got really really angry. Um, they are basically just saying, oh God, here you have those stupid people in Wallonia who don't want to work, who are lazy, they are blocking economic uh, uh, development, they are blocking job creation. And uh, the whole, I know the Flemish uh, um, Prime Minister was saying on the news, uh, you know, the whole of Europe is in favor of CETA except those stupid Walloons. I mean, almost literally, he didn't use the word stupid. But, you know, and it's, it's again, it's, it's, it's lying. For me, as a citizen's, uh, citizen, it's just plain lying because he knows that in his own region called Flanders, all the unions, the, the consumer organizations, farmer organizations, uh, uh, development cooperation organizations, you name it, citizens, they, they openly declare themselves as uh, 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 anti-CETA. Anti so, to end with this um, and to demonstrate why it's really undemocratic, it's getting to a boiling point and what are the commentaries of our noble um, <coughs> European, uh, um, you know, like for, for example, Karel de Gucht, a, a Belgian guy who was the, um, uh, the trade commissioner in the European Commission uh, before 2014, who started negotiating TTIP and CETA. He said, we negotiated six years and now uh, they just have to sign. You know, uh, okay, so this parliament basically has just to say, oh, thank you, thank you for negotiating this for six years, and now just have to shut up and sign. I mean, this kind of statement we were hearing, hearing yesterday all over the news with a lot of authority from uh, politicians that are so-called respected, and, you know, it, it fundamentally boiled down from, for us the, the fact that, you know, where is the democracy here? Um, and then I, because I'm maybe talking too long, uh, I, I wanted to go to the glyphosate issue. Five minutes. My boss, my boss, he has a lot of glyphosate in his urine. We uh, we launched this. Uh, I start on a light note, but I, of course we we'll take this quite serious. Um, well, we, we, we launched an action to, uh, it was, I think, somewhere mentioned, I heard it, uh, ah, it was on the, in the tribunal. The uh, farmer from, 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 uh, from um, Denmark referred to it. But we launched an action calling on politicians who have to decide on these kind of uh, issues to have their own urine tested. And of course, we knew that uh, a lot of members of parliament were doing it, we found it uh, uh, there was even one German Christian Democrat who shouted out in their group meeting, these Greens and the others are crazy, they're turning the parliament into a pissoir. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I'm quite proud that we he got angry. But, uh, I mean, just a long story short, all the MEPs tested positive, and of course it was just a way of, of campaigning. I mean, uh, it, it was a 60 MEPs only took part, there are 750. Um, why do we, did we did it? But well, because we wanted to make the point that, um, that politicians who decide on uh, uh, allowing these kinds of products on the market, they should, you know, they should, they should be encouraging um, uh, public tests or, or scientific research to show how much citizens and themselves are exposed to this product. Because if you want to decide on it, you have to at least know how, many, how much people are exposed to it and not try to you know, to block it or shy away from it. But that was sort of the rationale. Um, you know that uh, the permission for glyphosate expired at the end of 2015, and the European Commission needed to make a, a decision if they were going to prolong. Now, the, uh, the, the maximum prolongation in, on, in, on the European market is 10 years. Basically, if the civil society and some politicians wouldn't have reacted, they would have just done it. They would have just signed it and, you know, it was again for 10 years on our back. We made a lot of fuss with a lot of success, I think, 
Um, so, um, finally, we sort of had a, a vote in the parliament uh, which, which said, well, you can't, you have to, you have to reassess and you have to uh, minimize the prolongation. I mean, it was not perfect, we were not happy because we are obviously in favor of a ban uh, very, very fast. But, I mean, this is, uh, alas, how politics go. Um, and um, after that, to, 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 uh, to, to, uh, to conclude, uh, the phase where we are in now, and that's a, a battle we are doing together with, uh, with Nina's organization, is to get transparency. To say the European Union is to improve transparency, to uh, um, renew, revitalize democracy by being creative, because um, we, are, we are very, very worried. I mean, my boss, between brackets, uh, he's a really a pro-European, he has always been, but yes, yesterday he, he was so angry that he said, I don't know if I still can defend it, you know, and it was, for me, honestly, it was a bit shocking. It was like, what are you saying? Are you going to become a Eurosceptic? He said, oh, fuck hell, yeah, maybe, I will, because it's getting too much. Um, so, the science. Nina explained it already very well. You know that our uh, European Food Safety Authority, EFSA, said, no, IARC, you are wrong. Glyphosate is not dangerous. Yeah, there you are. All our um, uh, other, our political opponents are saying, ah, you see, Greens, when EFSA said on uh, neonicotinoids that they were dangerous for bees, you were saying, yeah, EFSA, good. And it helped us in our political struggle to get neonics banned for a short, well, limited, but it was a ban. Uh, now, EFSA said, glyphosate is safe. So our political opponents told us, but uh, why are you now criticizing EFSA? You know. Um, so we said, well, first of all, we found it a bit strange that the EFSA director, Mr. Earl, said in the European Parliament, on the record, that IARC was performing Facebook science. I mean, here you have a director of a European institution which we don't want to discredit. We, have, we think an independent, functioning, scientific body of the European Union is crucial and we have to defend it, we should cherish it and we should you know, make it more transparent and more democratic and more uh, scientifically independent, which uh, is not because the former that are not enough, not enough because the former, one of the former heads of EFSA was actually also on the board of Ilse. Huh? She had to step down when, when that was revealed. But, um, so basically we started together with CEO, um, well we did it independently but at the same time almost, um, uh, to, to say to EFSA, well you claim that you based your analysis, uh, your assessment of life say, on much more studies than the scientists of IARC have done and therefore that your assessment is just better. I mean, I'm saying it in simple words. Um, so we said, well, sorry, but then at least you should give independent science, scientists uh, access to those data, which they obviously refused. Um, so we filed an access to information request, uh, uh, CEO and, and uh, four green uh, uh, MEPs. Um, Basically, EFSA dragged its feet for a long time. They, um, they said, well, we cannot because this is commercial information and we will get sued by Monsanto, which in the meantime had created the Glyphosate Task Force Group, which is a sort of lobby group. Um, I think it was, a, it was a CEO who has revealed communication between this Glyphosate Task Force and the European Commission, where basically you could read very well where the power lies. Because Monsanto and Co. were, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, were basically setting the rules. They were setting the rules uh, to where transparency could go. And I mean, I found it quite shocking. I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah, otherwise, yeah. EFSA would be liable, they would be in court, basically. Now, we are not horrible people. We understand very well that EFSA is in a difficult situation, still is, as we speak. Because either they get sued by us, or they get sued by Monsanto. <laughs> it's not a very nice position to be in. But then again, you know, it boils down to the essence. On which side are you on? As a public institution. And um, last week, we got a, a finally a letter 
uh, from EFSA where they said, okay, we will give you, and uh, you received the letter as well, I guess, in by, in, in by now, okay, we will give you access to the data. And they immediately put out a press release, sort of, uh, yeah, we regard it as a PR stunt, saying that, uh, well, look how transparent we are. Now, we're not sure, we haven't seen any data yet. They promised that it will reach us on a CD-ROM uh, within two months. <laughs> we're very curious to see how many blackened parts there will be in. Um, and, yeah, we're just very, basically very curious. But we do think that in the meantime, Monsanto will probably will come up with some legal constraints, I guess. So, yeah, in a nutshell, that's a bit the battle. Um, uh, I could talk on, on yeah, much more, but that's not here. Well, I, I wanted to say a few things about the importance of mandatory labeling and independent safety testing before we start off. I mean, I believe that our out of control of food and farming and land use system is the number one contributor to greenhouse gases that's heating up the planet and is going to kill us all, you know, probably in about 25 years. Um, so the ETC group has done a very good analysis of how uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the categories they use are oversimplified. And if you look at the full uh, cycle, carbon cycle, of our food and farming and land use system, uh, the majority uh, of the greenhouse gases uh, come from this. This is everything from the energy used on the farms uh, to run the equipment uh, and the irrigation to the uh, fossil fuels used to produce uh, billions of pounds of toxic pesticides and fungicides, herbicides, uh, chemical fertilizer, uh, it extends into the fact that we're whacking down uh, the tropical rainforests of the world uh, so that we can have GMO uh, soybean plantations or so that we can have uh, palm oil plantations or so that we can have so-called biofuel. Uh, it includes these figures, the amount of energy used to <laughs> transport the food halfway around the world that used to be produced, you know, locally. Uh, it includes the carbon footprint of the enormous processing industry and packaging industry, which is literally 10 to 15 percent of all the, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the world. Uh, I mean, when I grew up, uh, and certainly in my grandparents' generation, you, you either grew your own food or you went to a grocery store where everything in that grocery store was from a hundred mile radius uh, and you went home and you cooked from scratch, you know? Right now in the United States, 90% of the food that consumers eat is processed, you know, and 60% is heavily processed. I guess the best way to describe that is 60% of the Amer food Americans are eating now uh, it's like gas station food. Uh, so if you've ever been to a USA gas station and looked at the, uh, at the uh, selection of cuisine, uh, that's why gringos are keeling over dead from heart disease and cancer. 48% of men now in the United States get cancer. 38% of women. You know, one out of every 43 boys now has autism. The government says, oh, yeah, that's a problem, but it's going to be one in two, you know, within, within 20 years, the way it's going. Uh, the obesity, the attention and deficit disorders. I mean, the United States is unraveling at the seams because of our out-of-control food and farming and land use system. And uh, I think the brain damage... Uh, in our reality TV show uh, presidential contest. <laughs> the only good point I want to say is we almost had a socialist as the president of the United States. You know, Bernie Sanders, if he would have gotten the nomination, he would have beat Trump by 35, you know, points. And the good thing about Bernie Sanders is that three quarters of young people supported 
So uh, uh, I don't know if it's because the millennials aren't eating uh, enough McDonald's uh, burgers anymore or whatever, but they seem to be <laughs> able to see reality and see the difference between lies and truth. You know, and I'm proud to say we have an amazing urban agriculture movement developing in the United States that's led by young people almost completely. And it's young people of all races and economic uh, backgrounds. And it is going to be a powerful force, and already is. Um, so the importance, I believe, that mandatory labeling and independent safety testing are a life and death issue. Uh, to me, the perfect example is I worked uh, uh, and Vandana did and others. I worked with the European grassroots movement in the late 90s uh, when you successfully got mandatory labeling of GMOs, you know, in food. And that was a very, very exciting, inspirational thing for the entire world. Um, so as a consequence, uh, the difference in, in the European Union and uh, say the United Snakes, oh, United States, is uh, <laughs> that uh, you don't have hardly any GMO food on the grocery store shelves. You know, in the United States, 80% of our processed food in grocery stores has GMOs in it. You know, you also don't have very many farmers growing the franken franken crops. You know, I mean, you've got a little bit in. In Spain, uh, a little bit, I believe, in is it Romania. Uh, but it's basically, if you hadn't, you, the, the grassroots, hadn't rammed through that, that bill, we would have much, much more damage uh, to the global environment, and you would have a, you'd have a physical profile much more uh, resembling uh, North Americans than you have uh, here. I see a lot of healthy people walking around uh, who seem to still have, uh, you know, a, a vital life force in them and so on. Okay, one thing that didn't happen, however, and it's partly because we didn't understand back in the late 90s the, the absolute importance of this was that your labeling laws forgot or did not cover animal feed. So one thing I find distressing about Europe, even compared to the United States and Canada and Mexico, is that the awareness level of people here, when they pull out their wallet to buy meat or an animal product, or when they go into a restaurant and order off the menu, it's just like, what are people thinking about? You know, I mean, these factory farms uh, that produce two-thirds of the meat and animal products in the entire world, right? I mean, what are they feeding the animals? What are they feeding the animals in the non-organic farms in, in Holland, you know, or in Denmark, or all over Europe? These are GMOs, right? And I think, I think our brothers and sisters from Argentina and from Paraguay and Brazil sure wish you would have passed a GMO feed labeling bill because they have watched the Amazon go down, you know. And the reason, the primary reason why the Amazon has gone down, why small farmers have been, you know, basically kicked off the land, you know, why, you know, 12 million people in Argentina are in the line of fire with these damn airplanes spraying poison is because your animal feed is the engine driving that. Of course, it's only, like I know from Argentina, I believe it's only 20% your, your responsibility. The other 80% is China. China is buying 80% of this genetically engineered soy uh, and, and you know corn uh, for their factory farms. And we are not going to save the planet if we destroy the lungs of the planet. You know? We have got to step up to the plate and really act in solidarity with the people of Latin America 
and the people in Asia. forest, the lungs of the planet, we're done. I mean, we've got to start the other way. We used to have 15 trillion trees on the earth. Now we got 10 trillion trees. We've got to plant trees, appropriate species. Agroforestry has to become an integral part, like it once was, of agriculture. we got to release the billions of animals on the planet who are imprisoned in these factory farms, being stuffed with genetically engineered grain and drugged with the antibiotics and the hormones and that. If we don't release those animals from prison and stop eating that crap, we're all going to perish in a, in a climate holocaust that is accelerating every day. What I like about veganism and vegetarianism, I was a vegetarian for 40 years, um, is that they don't eat factory farm meat and animal products. You know? That should be the example for every one of us. Don't ever eat another bite of factory farm meat or animal products. I mean, that's not difficult to understand, but in Europe, you would have to act like a vegan. Because the restaurants, they don't tell you anything, you know, about where'd that come from, you know, and, and even the fish. You know, we're eating, we're eating salmon all over the world, you know, from factory farms, you know. We need to stop doing that. Okay. So anyway, you led the, you led the world with, with GMO labeling. Yes, that beer has glyphosate in it. <laughs> I just had one myself. I, I feel a little agitated from all that glyphosate circulating through my body. Uh, but, uh, okay. So, it really is important that you have, you have fought and struggled for the right to know, for the right to choose. You know, European, this is the European activist I'm talking to. But you need to complete the job, you know. You need to complete the job, you know? And we can't be consuming meat and animal products coming from this system, you know, much longer. We gotta get the animals back on the land because believe it or not, they're gonna get the carbon from the atmosphere and they're gonna help us put it back in the ground where it used to be. Well, how do they do that? Well, if, you, if they're grazing, herbivores especially, if they're grazing on perennial grasses out there, what they do is they bite off the top of the grass. Uh, and if they have the freedom to move, they will, you know, enjoy that sweetest part themselves and move on to something else, okay? Once the plant has the top third bitten off by an animal, the plant automatically sends a signal down to its roots to shed the roots and to concentrate on rebuilding, you know, the top part so it can survive, okay? That's, that's the kind of animal agriculture that we need. The cows will save us, you know, but only if we let them out of prison, you know, and only if we stop acting like uh, well, meat's just meat, you know, and you either eat it or you don't. Ah, uh, no. And, uh, okay, I'm going to shift gears to the, to the USA here for a minute. Um, starting in 1985, the USDA and industry started doing polling of Americans about genetically engineered food, even though we were, this was nine years before bovine growth hormones started to be injected into dairy cows. Um, what they saw was that, you know, everyone wanted labeling. And when you ask them, why do you want labeling? Because I don't want to eat that stuff, okay? So they deliberately moved forward, and in 1992, you know, the, uh, the Bush administration, the first Bush administration, uh, they promulgated this, uh, ridiculous principle called substantial equivalence, you know? 
It's just like, this is the most bizarre thing of all time. Here we always had to label things like irradiated food. You know, when they, when they tried to roll out irradiated food, you know, the food movement in the late 80s, we rose up and we forced them to obey the law, which said that when you put a new food additive into food or something that changes its essential nature, it has to be labeled, right? Okay. Well, they saw, uh-oh, what happened to irradiated food in the U.S.? Well, it never went anywhere because it has to be labeled. Uh, and because it's dangerous, of course, uh, as well. But, um, so they said in 1992, yeah, GMOs are the same thing as non-GMOs. We don't have to have any special safety testing, and we don't have to have labeling. Okay. So we fought. From 1994, when bovine growth hormone came on the market, until this year for labeling, 22 years, you know, and we uh, tried everything possible. And it was interesting that American consumers, it was always the same. You know, they never changed their view. 90% of them wanted mandatory labeling. And if you ask them, well, why do you want labeling? They don't believe in some abstract right to know. They said, we want labeling so we can avoid buying the stuff, right? Okay. So the movement, uh, we were up against a corrupt government because we no longer have a democracy in the United States at the federal level. And most of the state governments, we don't have a democracy anymore. We don't have a free uh, mass media, and we don't have an independent scientific uh, uh, institutions, you know? We're living in a sort of 21st century uh, genetically engineered democracy, if you will, you know? <laughs> Where we have idiots on the Supreme Court, like Clarence Thomas, you know, famous for sexually molesting women before he uh, got to be on the Supreme Court. But Cl Thomas also worked as a lawyer uh, for Monsanto. So these cases that go all the way to the Supreme Court, guess which way? Thomas and the other, you know, right-wing extremists on the court are going to vote. Um, so, four years ago, uh, a little over four years ago, a group of us said, all right, we're tired of messing around with the federal government. Let's, let's pull a sort of a judo move, or the, find the Achilles heel of this system. And what it was was, if you pass a mandatory labeling law at the state level, right, through ballot initiatives or through, you know, massive grassroots pressure, uh, all the big companies are going to have to obey that, right? So what happened is in 2014, after fighting, we did these ballot initiatives in California 2012, in Washington State in 2013, Oregon 2014. We nearly won in all three places. We probably did win in California. They manipulated the electronic voting machine. But we raised from the grassroots in $25 donations $30 million over this three-year period to fight this. Incredible, you know, compared to what we thought we could do. But the other side, of course, spent $100 million. And they never argued that, that they were against labeling genetically engineered food. That would have been suicidal in PR terms. They said, oh yeah, we support consumers' right to know, but this bill is no good. It's going to make your groceries go up in price. It's going to hurt the family farmers in California. It's, it's just more government overreach, you know, where they want to tell you what to do. You know? And they managed to confuse enough people where we barely lost. But we also, we have one state in the United States where there's still a functioning democracy. It's called Vermont. That's where Bernie Sanders is. So we put all of our efforts uh, into doing the most massive grassroots lobbying uh, campaign that we had ever done. And lo and behold, they passed the law. So that law was going into effect this July, last July, 2016. What happened was all the big companies panicked. Coca-Cola, Pepsi, all of them, they're going to have to label their products in Vermont 
uh, are, and are they going to label them just in Vermont and the rest of the country? No, no, no. And they would even have to label in Canada. So th the big companies, one by one, started putting these labels. Starbucks on their Frappuccinos, you know, the, the junk food people all started rolling out the labels. So they said, oh, no, no, we can't have this. So they, they got their friends in the U.S. Congress uh, to basically pass the Dark Act, deny Americans the right to know. And, you know, President Obama, who's just like all the rest, uh, signed it into law. And uh, so overturning 100 years of, of Federalist principles in the United States, because we always had a, a thing where we're supposed to have a balance of power, according to the Constitution, between federal government and state governments. We always let state governments have control over things like food safety, uh, regulations, uh, uh, and labeling. But they, they reversed that. And these so-called libertarian Republicans who talk about states' rights when they want to uh, discriminate against uh, you know, black people or brown people, um, they all voted for it. And these so-called Democrats who claim to be for progressive consumer rights, they all voted for it too, nearly. Uh, and here's where we are. But we're not giving up, and in fact, uh, the, this compromise bill, they thought they were smart. So they said, well, we're, we're going to put smart codes on the packages, these little cubes that you can read with your smartphone. They said, yeah, in a few years, it'll be a few years, believe me, uh, we'll have these smart codes on foods and you know, if you have your uh, smartphone, which, you know, no poor people have, hardly, in the, in the uh, U.S., and if you have internet connection in the grocery store, which I don't know any grocery stores that have internet connection, and you have the time to go through 30 pages of propaganda on these damn food corporations' websites, you might find in tiny print um, uh, what you're looking for. Okay. What is sweeping the U.S.? We're going to boycott every food product that ever has a smart code on it. And the basic word out there is if the government won't let us have the right to know, you've got to stop buying anything unless it's organic, unless it's you know, non-GMO certified, or if you know the local farmer, or you grow it yourself. So we're not giving up. Uh, and we're going to intensify something that you need to do as well in Europe. We're going to start testing all these foods uh, on the market because once we find, for example, atrazine, you know, in the milk you're drinking if it's not organic, in the ice cream you're buying, in the meat, well, atrazine is supposedly banned in the European Union because it's a hormone disruptor that imparts per trillion castrates frogs, you know, and basically it is utter poison. Well, we need to go back now, and if they won't let you label uh, animal feed, we have to go test it ourselves. Once people understand they're poisoning us, I think people will, will rebel. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Thanks a lot.